Hey guys, Micah here with ebikeschool.com, and today we're going to be talking about how to choose your first electric bicycle. Now this might also be helpful for people who already have an e-bike and are looking to get another one, but I wanted to make this video after seeing tons of questions from people who are looking to buy their first e-bike and get into e-biking as a hobby, but they're maybe overwhelmed by the hundreds or even thousands of e-bike options out there. So hopefully this will be a helpful guide to uh, helping you along the way when you're choosing your first e-bike. Now when it comes to choosing your first e-bike, there are a couple of factors that I think it's important to look at to help you narrow down the sea of choices. And the two most important factors, in my opinion, are the type of e-bike and the price range or the quality range that you're looking for in your e-bike. Now I'm going to start by dividing e-bikes into basically seven different types or categories and some people are going to say no there needs to be more than that but you know we're not e-bike snobs here and I think this is going to basically point us in the right direction. So the seven different categories that I divide e-bikes into are the electric mountain bikes, electric cruisers, electric road bikes and commuter bikes that I'll lump together, folding electric bikes, electric cargo bikes, electric fat bikes, and sort of the other category. And we'll talk about what that means. So those are sort of the seven major ones. We'll start with electric mountain bikes, because these are very popular. Now, in electric mountain bikes, there are sort of different levels. There are true mountain bikes that are really meant to be on trails and riding downhill and stuff like that. And then there are sort of the entry-level electric mountain bikes. And I wouldn't really recommend taking these on any serious trails, but they can be good for use on the road because with either even cheap full suspension or just front suspension, it can be helpful for absorbing some of that road vibration and uh, hitting potholes, certainly absorbing more of it than uh, just a hardtail or a bike without any suspension. So if you're looking to either go uh, off-road, whether it's uh, legit like uh, downhill mountain biking or just riding on some trails, or if you're looking for something that you can take on the road and will just be a bit more comfortable, electric mountain bikes can be a good direction for you. Next we have electric cruisers. Now cruisers are very much a sort of uh, a laid back, more comfortable bike style. You're going to be sitting upright, you're not going to be hunched over the handlebars. Um, you're going to also have your feet more forwards on a cruiser. So you, normally the crank and the pedals are more forward on the bike. And that just gives you a more comfortable seating position where you can usually put your feet flat on the ground when you come to a stop instead of either having to dismount from the seat or just sort of like put your tiptoes down. Cruiser bikes are great when you're not really worried about efficiency and you're more interested in having just a comfortable ride. You know, the, the epitome of the cruiser bike is basically riding along beach paths where you're just out there having a good time riding along. So electric cruiser bikes can be really great and there are some beautiful ones out there. Uh, a company called Rayvolt in Barcelona makes their cruiser, which I think is just one of the most beautiful ones I've seen, but there are a lot of different options out there. Next we have electric road and commuter bikes, and these are great for a, a couple different types of e-bike hobbyists. Uh, the first would be people who want to really get exercise on their bike, and so they're out there pedaling, they're climbing hills, and they just want a little bit of assist. And so electric road bikes are great for that because they're very efficient at pedaling. There's not a lot of extra weight. They come with saddles that are good for uh, proper pedaling geometry. And they're basically just going to be your more uh, sporty type of uh, street bikes. Uh, the other group that I'm sort of lumping in here are the hybrids and commuter bikes. And uh, this can cover a wide variety, you know, this can be like even, uh, you know, hybrids, cyclocross, gravel bikes, basically bikes that are meant to be um, on road, but they're a little more comfortable than your standard road bikes. You know, they're not like super lightweight frames, they might be a little bit heavier, but that means they're designed with maybe a larger seat, they're a little more robust. In the case of gravel bikes, they're actually meant to be able to go off-road instead of just staying in the bike lanes. And so if you're really looking at something that you're going to be commuting to work on, perhaps, or you're going to be using for exercise, road bikes and commuter bikes are probably going to be what you're looking for. Next is electric cargo bikes. And these are a lot of fun. I always enjoy riding them, though I don't have a lot of use for one. But electric cargo bikes are basically the minivans of the e-bike world. And what they're great for is just hauling a bunch of cargo. You know, this is the type of e-bike you're going to get if you're bringing two or three kids to school every morning, or if you're trying to replace a car and use your e-bike to get your uh, weekly groceries. There's a few different types that you can look at. The first is the front loader, which has a large bucket in the front, and you'll notice the steering is stretched really far in the front there. Uh, these are nice for really loading up with a lot of stuff, 
but the downside is they're quite long, and so maneuvering them can be a little awkward, especially at slower speeds. The next type would be sort of the rear loading, and these often have a stretched rear, and what that does is gives you uh, a lot more room for a bench in the back or to put really long panniers. There's often sort of like uh, floorboards on either side of the rear where you can either load those suckers up with crates or uh, pannier bags, or when you put kids on there, they can put their feet on those boards. Or I've seen these pulling adults as well. So uh, if you're looking for a bike that can just carry a ton of stuff, a cargo bike is the way to go. Next are the electric folding bikes, and these are super convenient if you need an electric bike that is extremely portable. So if you're bringing your bike on the subway or the bus every day, or you want to stick it in your trunk and drive from the suburbs to the city, park somewhere on the outskirts, and then pedal in, an electric folder can be great. The thing about electric folding bikes, though, is that um, not always, but often they can be somewhat lower quality just because it's a little more expensive to design and build an electric folding bike, and so... Uh, a lot of times the compromise is that you get lower quality bicycle components. It's not necessarily that the frame is lower quality or that the batteries or that the motor are lower quality. Those are usually pretty standard. But what often happens is to keep the price down, companies will just use lower quality or more entry level components. So lower quality brakes, shifters, those kinds of things. So it is something to look out for, but I don't want to say that all folders are cheap because they're not. There are some really great ones out there. Um, I was riding the Oyama, I think it was the C8XD, I don't know, it was a lot of letters. I'll, I'll look it up and put it on the screen. But this was a really great folder. It was like 1500 bucks, had hydraulic brakes, and it was just really well designed. So there are some really nice quality electric folders out there. Next are the electric fat bikes. These are probably the most fun group. They're certainly not the most efficient. If you have to pedal one of these without a battery, it's not going to be a lot of fun, especially if you're going uphill, because these get very heavy. But they can ride over just about any terrain. Uh, the things that they're known for are being able to ride in sand and snow. But you can take these off-road. They're great on trails. You can you know, hop curbs. You can ride down stairs. With these giant uh, fat tires, they're just a lot of fun for riding over anything. Uh, I was recently riding the Rad Rover from Rad Power Bikes, and that bike is just a hoot. I really love being able to go either in the bike lane or switch onto grassy fields or hit the trails, and basically everything feels the same, you know? You don't really notice a difference between the different trains. So if you want a bike that might not be the lightest or the most efficient, but is a lot of fun and can ride on anything, fat bikes are probably the answer. And if you want to ride on snow or sand, they're probably the only answer. Lastly, we have sort of the other category, which I would say are the electric tandems or the electric recumbents and uh, maybe tricycles as well. So tandems are for two people, or you can find more, you know, you can have three or four person bikes, but generally they're two people. Um, and these are fun if you get along really well with your partner. Uh, but I've, I think a lot of people who start on tandems end up just getting their wife or husband their own electric bicycle because the novelty can sometimes wear off. But it, it is fun being able to ride a two-person bike around and you get a lot of looks. So it's something to try out if you have the opportunity at least. Uh, next I would lump uh, recumbents into this other category. Recumbents are nice if you want the most comfortable position on a bike, which is basically to sit in a chair or even like lay back. And uh, the other thing recumbents are good for is being extremely efficient. Because you're more reclined in a recumbent, you have less of a surface area, and so your drag through the air is a lot lower. And what that means is that on the same battery and motor, you could get a lot more range. The downside to recumbents is that they're not as visible, so there is a safety issue. You want to make sure you have one of those like orange go-kart flags or, or something to make sure you're seen by cars, because you're going to be down lower than a normal bike. And lastly, I'd put electric tricycles in this other category as well. Uh, there's sort of two styles. There's the Delta trike, which looks like every little kid's tricycle with two wheels in the back. And those are the cheaper style of tricycles, but they're not as stable. So if you take a turn at higher speeds on a Delta trike, you can tip them fairly easily. The other option is a Tadpole trike, which has two wheels in the front. And these are a lot more expensive because you have to design two wheel steering but they're more stable at speed. So if you're gonna be riding this thing fast, you might wanna look at a tadpole trike. So those are the different types of electric bicycles. And once you know what you wanna do with your e-bike, you can immediately remove a lot of the various options out there and cut through the noise. Like if you know you're gonna be going off-road, you're basically looking at either an electric mountain bike or an electric fat bike. If you know you're only gonna be in the bike lane, you're probably looking at some type of road or commuter bike or perhaps a folder. 
Um, if you know that you want to be riding with your wife or your husband on the back, you're looking at a tandem. So hopefully by determining what exactly you want to do with your bike, you can start to look at the, the specific category that will be right for you. The next thing to consider though is the price and the quality range you're looking for. And these aren't always the same, but they often go fairly well together. They often correlate. So I think looking at both of them is very helpful. I'm going to break these into a few categories. First, I'll start with what I call the ultra budget bikes. These are in the like $300 to $500 range. And there's starting to be a wider selection in this range. Xiaomi just came out with a couple of e-bikes that are in the two to $350 range. Though when they get brought to the US, they're closer to the four to $500 range. Um, there are also some electric scooter bike things that don't really have pedals, but usually cost about $400 or so that are kind of fun. Um, they fold up. And so if you just need a quick, you know, little way to get from the subway station to work, those can be a nice option. They're basically the equivalent performance of a stand-on electric scooter, but they provide a seat and a more comfortable way to ride, and you feel a lot more stable when you're sitting down as well. The problem with the ultra budget category is just that these are really cheap. You know, you're not going to get something that's going to last you for years and years. The uh, bicycle components are usually non-branded, no name. You know, it's just some random pop metal brake lever and you don't know where it came from, how well it's going to work, and it might break off in a couple months. Uh, the battery cells are usually not branded cells. You know, they're not LG or Samsung or Sony. They're just some random brand, uh, hopefully not Ultrafire or something like that, but who knows? And so you really, you get what you pay for with these ultra budget options. I've ridden some that, you know, were fun to ride and especially those little bike scooter things, they're kind of a hoot. But if you have a little bit more to spend, you know, just a little bit higher budget, I would recommend looking at the next category, which I consider to be the budget level electric bicycles. And these are anywhere from, you know, $500 to maybe $1,000. And once you move into this category, you've got a lot more options and the quality of the components start to pick up. Usually in this level, you're looking at uh, branded components. So it's not no name brake levers and shifters anymore. Now you're starting to look at like Tektro brakes and, you know, entry level Shimano parts, which aren't going to be the high end stuff, but they're at least coming from a company that um, has a brand name that you can trust and that you know what kind of manufacturing they use. So I always like to see branded components when possible because it at least gives some basic level of assurance of quality. Now again, you're going to be looking at entry level parts. So you know it's going to be like Aries shifters from Shimano and stuff like that. These are the bottom of their hierarchy, but it's still better than nothing. You're also going to start seeing better electrical components. Once you get into the $500 to $1,000 range, you're probably going to get into branded batteries. So you know you're going to have a Panasonic battery instead of some random whatever cell that was the cheapest on the market that day battery. Motors aren't really going to change that much, to be honest. You know, you'll probably find the same motors on an ultra budget or a budget bike or even the sort of medium uh, mid-level price range bikes because there's just not that many different companies making motors. So um, you'll probably find similar hub motors on a lot of these bikes, but you get into the better frames. You also get into larger bikes because when you can spend a little bit more, you can spend more to build a larger frame. So you're looking at, you know, full size mountain bikes. You're not going to have great suspension at this level, but you might have a suspension fork. Um, I wouldn't recommend getting a full suspension e-bike that costs less than $1,000. It's just going to have some cheap spring in the back that is going to be worse than a hardtail. So I would certainly avoid uh, full suspension at this level. Wait until you get to the next one above $1,000. But I've ridden some pretty decent bikes in the uh, seven dollars $800 price range. They are not what I would call good quality bikes, but if you're not sure that you want to stick with electric bikes yet and you're just getting into this hobby, buying a seven or $800 bike on Amazon could be a decent option. Once you move into the next level of electric bicycles though, which I would call the mid-range, you're starting to look at much better quality parts. These are going to be bikes anywhere in the, I would say, $1,000 to $2,500. And this is where the components really start to improve. You're going to be looking at suspension that's more than just a dinky spring. You're going to be looking at frames that are potentially hydroformed. You're going to be looking at tires from companies that you recognize the name on them. You know, they're going to be at least Kenda or something like that, and not some random name that you wonder if the rubber is going to fall apart in a couple hundred miles. This is sort of the sweet spot where I think there is some of the best bang for your buck. There are a lot of really great bicycles out there in the $1,500 range that have good quality batteries, good quality motors, and companies that are providing a warranty. 
So at that point, people feel more comfortable risking maybe you know $1,500, $1,800 if they know they're getting better parts in a company that's going to stand behind the product. I struggle to recommend you know any one company, but I, I have used a lot of e-bikes that I feel like are good quality in this range. Companies like uh, the Rad Power bikes, I mentioned the Rover before. Uh, Blix bikes, I rode their Aveni, and that was a really nice uh, sort of street commuter bike uh, that felt like really good quality and was nicely made. Uh, there was the Oyama folder from earlier. Another one is the Gen Z 200 series that I've been riding recently. And this is another example of a bike that once you step into the mid-range, you know, this is like a $1,900 or $2,000 e-bike. Suddenly you get much nicer parts. So this has a Bafang motor, a nice display built into the bike itself. It's got a smartphone app that allows you to do things like track your bike and update the uh, specific settings on your bike, things like that. So uh, again, this is really the category where you're going to get the better bang for your buck. Next, we have the premium electric bicycles, which I would consider to be bikes in the $2,500 to $5,000 range. And these are going to be bikes that have much better bike components. Generally, you're not going to see a huge difference in the electronics of these bikes, because at this point, we're already looking at branded batteries. We're already looking at good quality motors. But what you might notice are different types of motors. Uh, we're going to be, see a shift from hub motors to mid drives, something like uh, the Bosch system or Yamaha, Panasonic, uh, Shimano. Um, let's, there's a, oh, Bros as well. Can't forget Bros. They've got a nice system. A lot of these systems are expensive enough that you're not going to find them on bikes priced at less than 2000 But once you move into the more premium category and even the lower end of the premium, you'll start to see these nicer motor systems. You're also going to see other components, like potentially uh, Gates belt drives. I was riding the Priority Embark recently, and that's got a really nice system. It's got the Bosch motor, it's got a Gates carbon belt drive, it's got hydraulic brakes. And so uh, sometimes you'll see on lower end bikes maybe one of those systems, probably not the Gates carbon drive, that's pretty premium. But it's rare to see all of those components together on a bike that costs as low as $4,000 in the case of the Priority Embark. So in the premium category, you really start to see these better bike parts. You'll also get to some bikes that are priced in this category, but might not deserve to be here. And I hate picking on any one company, but I am going to point out Pedego here. And I have nothing against Pedego. They make some nice bikes. But... A lot of their bikes are priced in the four to $5,000 range, and I feel like the quality is maybe $1,000 less than where they're priced. It's just they've got a lot of overhead. You know, they got a huge marketing campaign. Uh, they got to pay for dealers all over the place. They got to pay William Shatner to talk about how great their bikes are. And so when you go with a company like that, it might have a premium price, but, you know, we're looking at rack batteries, which is kind of like 2012, right? Um... So again, just because something is priced higher doesn't necessarily mean it's the same thing. Uh, I'd take a $4,000 Priority Embark over a $5,000 Pedego any day because the level of quality of the components are just totally different. Uh, so it's just something to think about. And again, like nothing against Pedego, you know, good quality bikes, but not quite where the, the price point is, I would say. And lastly, we have the ultra premium bikes. Now, in the ultra premium category, which I would say is anywhere from like five to $10,000, there are sort of two different types of bikes. There are the um, super high end road commuter bikes and the super high end downhill mountain bikes. And on both of these, the big difference is really going to be the bike components. Some of these will have, you know, thousand dollar hubs or uh, $500 electronic shifting systems. So these are the kind of things that when you add them to the bike, really jack up the price. If you're looking at a premium electric bicycle, it's because you have fully committed to the idea of using e-bikes. You are going all in in this category. Uh, for downhill electric bikes, this is one of the things I learned when I was at um, Innerbike in Reno this last year. I rode a ton of different downhill electric mountain bikes and comparing them to cheaper mountain bikes, you could see a huge difference. When I was going down some fairly tricky descents, I was using some five, six, seven thousand dollar high bike electric bikes, and that was just like a dream. The bikes rode amazing, you know, I felt really good doing it. And then I do the same trail on like a two thousand dollar Magnum Peak, and suddenly I felt like I was gonna die. Like the bike is not built for extreme downhill mountain biking. And that's okay because you know this is one of these mountain bikes that you can take it on trails, but it really it's you know it's a great commuter bike. It's one of these mountain bikes that works great on the street. 
But if you want to do some serious off-roading, you want to be doing, you know, jumps and riding off tables and stuff, you're looking at these ultra premium uh, downhill electric mountain bikes. Same thing for if you want to be riding like serious street bikes, you know, if you want to be on a Stromer ST5, which is like a $10,000 e-bike, you're going to be looking at some really high-end parts. Uh, that one specifically is another one that I feel like uh, the value isn't quite where the price is. Um, I've ridden an ST5 and it was a really nice bike, you know, like electronic shifting is fun. It works really well, but it wasn't a $10,000 feeling bike. So again, you have to look at the quality of these things compared to the price. And just because there's a premium or ultra premium price on it doesn't always mean the quality is there. But in this category, you are going to find some really nice bikes out there. So I hope that this uh, summary has helped you narrow down your search a bit. There's sort of two things to look for. First is, what are you going to be doing on your bike? And second is, how much do you really want to spend and how important is that quality for you? Do you want to get in on like a seven, $800 Amazon bike and just see if you like e-biking? Or are you ready to commit with like a $3,000 mid-range or a $5,000 premium electric bicycle? I hope you guys found that helpful. And last but not least, it is time to announce the winner of last week's book giveaway. And the winner is... Luis Fernandez. So congratulations, Luis. Just let me know which one of my books you'd like. Either the Ultimate Do-It-Yourself E-Bike Guide, DIY Lithium Batteries, or DIY Solar Power. And anyone else who wants to win one of my books, all you have to do is put a comment below this video saying anything you want, and hopefully you'll be the randomly selected commenter at the end of my next video. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.